Hello, I'm Dawn Durham, and welcome to Patent Pod. To achieve positive outcomes for students, our Tier 1 instruction, the instruction we pro provide to all of our students, needs to be robust. In order to bolster and support those efforts, particularly in math and reading, we need to consider class-wide interventions. Joining Patent Pod today is Dr. Matthew Burns to help us understand how we utilize our data to determine the need for intervention and how to go about conducting such an intervention in a class-wide manner. Dr. Burns, thank you so much for joining Patent Pod today. We're excited to have this conversation with you. Thank you, Dawn. Thanks for having me. I, I'm excited to be part of this and appreciate all the great work that Patent does. Thank you. On behalf of the entire patent system, I'll say thank you for that compliment. We're super excited to continue our efforts across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Let's dig into class-wide intervention a little bit. And I think it's important, Dr. Burns, that we kind of start by talking about that class-wide intervention stems from data. It really starts at the data level. And so when we think about universal screening or screening our classroom and our students, we know that that data is going to determine if we deploy an intervention or not. So help us understand what can data tell us about a class-wide need? Well, they can do several things. Uh, first of all, you have to start with a good, a good screener. And in many situations, you know, star, star math, star reading, um, the map measures are, are quite good. curriculum based measure, those are all, those are really good screeners. The advantage that MAP and STAR have is they can give you some really good information uh, about specific strengths and weaknesses that students have for the entire classroom. Not for indiv individual kids, they don't do that very well, but for the whole classroom, that they can. So you can help as, an, as a teacher really dive into those data and say, wow, my kids need more work in phonemic awareness or something. But for class by intervention, uh, we just take our screener and we, we want to keep this as a low-level analysis. Remember, this is a part of the MTSS system, which I'm talking about, which is which is parallel to it and, and incorporated in the instructional uh, system. So we will um, we will look at the screener and we look at the class median. If that class median is below the criterion, no matter what the screener is, if that class median is below the criterion. So let's say in fall, the, in third grade, the CBM benchmark is you know 85. I made that number up, might be wrong. Uh, and we use star, uh, in third grade, the, the, at the benchmark, they're supposed to be in the fall, they're supposed to be at a 380. Again, I'm making these numbers up. And if the class median is below that benchmark, that suggests there's a class-wide need. So we look at the median, not the average, the median, because the, the number of kids is, in one classroom is too small to use average. We look at that class median, if it's below the criterion, that suggests there's a class-wide need. If you have a good screener, that can be a, that can be a reliable decision to tell you, you know, something we need to dive in more deeply with these kids. So what I hear you saying is when we think about, and this is kind of a low level analysis as you had indicated, mm -hmm. we're really looking at that median score within the class, not the average, but that median score to tell us, hey, as a whole group, we've identified a need. So I wanna, I wanna kind of continue down this train of thought. So now we've identified that there is a class need, a particular skill, phonemic awareness, numbers and operations, whatever the case may be. Why would a class-wide intervention be beneficial? Why would that be more beneficial than perhaps trying to problem solve through advanced tiers? Oh, okay. So there's, uh, it, it's beneficial because it does a couple of things. Um, I'm going to answer that two ways. One, an MTSS perspective through tiers and the other sort of in instructional as well. Okay. Um, so it helps them. We don't want to do advanced analysis in tier one because we just don't have the, the, the resources to do that. If we were to do this in-depth analysis and find, well, you have 15 kids in your, your class who need, need support, and we need 10 different interventions, you just you can't do a small group intervention with that many kids. You just, you just can't. 15 out of, say, 20 or 22 or something. So what the first thing that does, a class wide intervention does, is it gets that number down to a more manageable number. Okay. Uh, it gets that number, and we've consistently seen. Uh, my research I do primarily, I've done some of the Amanda Vanderheen in, in math. That's her her area. I do the reading side, and we've collaborated on, across both. Um, but for math and for reading, we consistently see that number get down to roughly 20%. So if you know, 50 60% of your kids need intervention, with a quick classified intervention, we can get that number down to roughly 20 25%. And then there is a manageable number that we can now look at and do small group intervention. 
Uh, it also helps kids. There's, there are kids who just need a little bit of a bump, right? And, it, and it's designed to help those kids. Um, and then lastly, it increases decision accuracy. Uh, some unpublished data I have, we looked at that. Uh, I'll tell you why it's unpublished in a second. We looked at it and um, we saw that we, we had um, the diagnostic accuracy before class intervention using CBM and the measures of academic progress as our criterion was about 70%, which is okay, but not great. Mm -hmm. After we did class intervention, that number went up to 90%. The kids who need help still need help. Right, and so you're not you're not weeding out those kids. You're weeding out the kids who just need the bump. So it increases decision making accuracy. The reason it's unpublished, by the way, is that was a kind of a pilot, mm -hmm. and I went back to do the study the following fall with that same school district, and because the classified intervention worked so well, they just did classified intervention before they started screening. <laughs> Which was great, but it kind of ruined my study. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a good problem to have, right? When the kids yes. don't need your your assistance anymore, that's a good problem to yeah, have. That's right. That's right. When we're thinking yeah. about this, no. I just want to make sure I understand class wide the benefit of class wide intervention. This is really talking about resource allocation, is what I hear you yeah. saying. Getting that number of true students in need down, so that we can truly help and resource or allocate our resources most appropriately to those who need the most intensified support. And you're talking, which I think is a key piece here about being accurate in our problem-solving decisions, being accurate in those decisions based on what level of support do particular students need when we talk about those multi-tiered system of, systems of support. And I think that's such a key piece is that accuracy of decision-making. And the, the truth remains, Dr. Burns, as you had talked about, resource allocation is something we have to continually think about and reflect on and fine-tune for all of our schools. So I appreciate you, you bringing that Absolutely. to our attention. So then let me, I want to kind of continue down this path here. We've identified there's a class-wide need. We've used the median. Um, the majority of our students are below that criterion. They're, we've deployed, um, we determined we're going to deploy class-wide intervention because of the benefits we just talked about. How do I go about identifying the intervention I'm using class-wide? Are there some interventions that are more beneficial than others as it relates to, let's say, reading and math? Yes, absolutely. So. Uh, I mean, I said earlier, I'm going to try and answer that instruction. Let me let me answer that because it answers this question as well. So the, if, a, if a teacher sees a, a, a students who have specific needs, the teacher as part of a professional learning community, as you know, part of their PLC or whatever model they use, mm -hmm. will certainly dive into those data and figure out how they can change their instruction to better meet the needs of kids. Absolutely. That's, that needs to happen. And that needs to happen at the same time class intervention starts. Because sometimes a conversation about looking at your data and um, how to how to better teach the kids and meet their needs ongoing. Sometimes that takes time to to deliver and to change. Well, we need to, we need to help these kids right now. So we're going to do both the class period intervention and meanwhile the PLC is going to dive into the data and say, okay, instructionally, how can we help these kids? So that's one thing. That's we're absolutely going to look at that. Now, from intervention perspective, we have to keep as, as the, just like the analysis is low level, the intervention has to be pretty standardized, pretty easy pretty low level. So we tend to focus on two things. Uh, I'll talk math first. Uh, math is very fluency based, the intervention. It's it's math facts. It's numbers, number, you know, number, number, uh, and number sense. So things you can practice as a whole group very efficiently. Uh -huh. And we've seen consistently now, especially the data Amanda Vanderheden has for math, where just simple math fact practice on a daily basis can get the number of kids who need support way down. I had a student, um, Sandy Pullis do her dissertation on this and found that we tried to do cons um, strategy-based instruction as our classified compared to just math fact practice to middle school kids. And the number of kids who needed support went way down for the for the fact practice, did not for the strategy approach. So really mm -hmm. simple. I know some people want more than that. Remember, you're going to hit the set instructionally too. You're going to do all those other great things. But for the classified intervention for math, it's a lot of fluency-based intervention. Okay. For reading, um, we do a couple things. I, I'm, I'll plug a program for just a second, which is KPALS. So for kindergarten, I still use KPALS. It's a research-based intervention developed at the University of uh, Vanderbilt. Um, it's, a, it's a strong intervention. It's easy. It's cheap. So I still use KPALS quite a bit. Uh, but in first grade, I use uh, Build a Word, where it's essentially where the, the, kid, the kids listen to the teacher read words that have a common um, vowel sound, for example, read words to them, tell us to 10 words, and the kids read them back and they practice spelling them. They go back to their desks and practice reading wordless to each other. And then uh, 
take magnetic letters and build words with these with these vowel sounds. It takes about 10, 15 minutes a day. And then the third one for reading is partner reading with paragraph shrinking, about 20 minutes a day. The kids um, are matched in heterogeneous pairs. They read texts written at the lower reader's instructional level, mm -hmm. at the lower reader's instructional level. And they take turns reading that out loud to each other for about five minutes each, and they take turns reading it again. After, after every paragraph, they do paragraph shrinking, which is a comprehension technique to, to shrink the whole paragraph down to just 10 words or less. It takes about 20 minutes a day. Uh, we do it for two to three weeks, depending on how old the kids are, uh, and we see really good growth. Now, I'll say with high school, so I, I, do, I do partner reading paragraph shrinking second through eighth grade. High school, I'll still come back and do, uh, and do high school panels. We've studied it second through eighth grade uh, in several schools all across the country. So I want to just kind of pull out a couple of key pieces here that you said, because there's so much valuable information there to talk about. You would first start off by saying, you know, while we're digging into data, while we're doing these deep data dives, we're already employing that class-wide intervention. Because as you said, these kids can't wait while we sit and analyze and dig through those data. And I think that's a really important piece to, to mention. When we're selecting our class-wide interventions, you had said it has to be standardized and it has to be efficient. It has to be something that the classroom teacher or an instructional assistant in the classroom, whomever is delivering that intervention, can pick up and implement easily and efficiently. And I think that's a really key piece to think about. It doesn't have to be, we don't want it to be complex structures and layering on of complexities. We want it to be standardized and efficient. Um, and it sounds like math is going to be pretty fluency based. And reading, as I was kind of thinking through the interventions you were talking about and the structure, the framework of those interventions, it sounded very specific skill based. Um, so really knowing where those skills are that the students need. Right. So let me ask you this, because you know this is going to happen. What about those students who don't show improvement with classified intervention? We're going to be using more data, progress monitoring data, kind of checking in every so often. How are we doing? How are we progressing? What happens? Because you know our practitioners are going to ask, what about those friends who do not show adequate improvement when mm -hmm. we're doing classified intervention? What then? So I, I, I'm going to tell a brief story to answer that question. I, when I go work with schools, I set up a team oftentimes, and I like to bring in the, the person who asks the hardest questions on the team. Uh, the person who, that you know, was sort of the naysayer, but because that person's often, of, also often someone that other teachers follow and look up to. And if you can persuade the, the naysayer, you can persuade all of them. Mm -hmm. So I had a teacher who was a naysayer towards classified intervention, and I had him on the team, and he piloted it, and it worked really well. And he came in, came the next meeting and sat down and went just like this. He said, I started talking, raised his hand. And I call him, you know, and he says, uh, uh, okay, this was great. A lot of kids did better, but of my 23 kids, they all did great, except five of them did not. What what happened to those five? And he literally sat back and thought and said this all out loud and said, what happened, what happened to those five? Well, those my those were my five lowest readers. And I guess this isn't really designed to help them. This is designed to help the other kids so I can focus on these kids. Uh, and that was it. I, I didn't say a word. I went, yeah. yes. <laughs> and then from then on, he was a, he was a, a big cheerleader for, for the program. It was an aha moment for him. Tier two and tier three exist for a reason. Mm. This is not a tier two intervention. This is not an MTS system. This is a piece of it. There will be, uh, we've seen on average 20% or 25, sometimes 25. Um, we, we see that number get down out of you know, 20, 25 kids in the classroom, 15 need help. That number goes down to five, for example. It will happen. There'll still be five kids who still need help. Those are the kids for whom we then dive in and do small group tier two interventions. And by the way, of those five kids, probably one or two of them will still need a tier three intervention, right? So, yeah. so we though uh, tier two exists for a reason. This is not a tier two intervention. Don't do tier two level analysis at tier one. Help as many kids as you can. Then the ones that don't, that's when we start a tier two intervention. I love it. I love that you said class wide intervention is a piece of MTSS. It is not your MTSS framework. It is a piece of that MTSS framework. And as you had said, advanced tiers were created for a reason. That's why we have those advanced tiers to intensify instruction. But I'm going to go back to why is class-wide intervention so beneficial? We talked about accurate decision-making. Part of that right. accurate decision-making is identifying those students who truly are in need of those more intensified supports of those advanced tiers. So class-wide intervention really helps you identify who truly in this classroom needs those advanced tiers? And then we could put those supports and services in place. 
while still, you know, enhancing the instruction we're providing to all of our students to really make those accurate problem solving decisions. And I think, I think this is all intertwined. And so I'm so glad that we were able to have this conversation and think through what does, what is class-wide intervention? What does it mean? What does it look like? Um, and then how do we, how do we use our data to determine that? So Dr. Burns, I, I'm so thankful that you were able to join Patent Pod today to talk about this and have this deep conversation with me. Um, we're so, we're so appreciative of all the work that you do for us in Pennsylvania. We'll continue to consider um, uh, Dr. Burns a good friend of Pennsylvania and we hope to continue our work with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I would welcome opportunities to future collaboration and, and support you in any way I can. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thank you to all of you in the field. You are truly an inspiration to us all. A special thank you to John Ragsdale for producing this podcast. We'll see you next time on Patent Pod.